Wouldn't it be great to have more happiness in your life? Sure, you'd say, I'd, I'd love that, but I have this set of circumstances I'm dealing with in my world. No doubt, we all do. But here's the thing. Happiness is something under your control, even in periods of struggle. And it's not a destination you strive to reach someday. It happens every day in this journey called life. And science shows it's enabled by your habits. I'm self-leadership expert Scott Mouse, and in this course, you'll learn a series of repeatable, powerful exercises designed to help you form a happiness habit. You'll learn that how you spend your time, how you experience the world, how you think, and how you interact with others all impact your happiness level, and you'll develop enjoyment-inducing routines in each of these areas. Now, of course, research shows that happiness can come from making changes to diet, sleep, and exercise, but we won't get into that here. That's for another course. We'll focus on the mindsets and actions you can take to jumpstart more joy in your life. And equipped with a series of science-backed, habit-forming exercises, you can create your own tailored routine for happiness. So, join me in my course, Happiness Habits. You'll be happy with the results. Okay, get ready for this. The goal is not to be happy all the time. Constant happiness might be a nice goal, but it's unrealistic. Human beings are vulnerable to ups and downs. In fact, it's the occasional downs that can make the ups all that more satisfying. There's also the reality that human beings adapt to their circumstances, then reset the bar for what will make them happy, which quite often means more of something. For example, say you get a nice raise at work, which makes you happy, of course. At some point, you get used to that new salary and you eventually want more, thinking you'll be happy again when you get more. It's this constant resetting of the baseline of what makes you happy, the continual need for more to achieve that next milestone that can prevent you from actually being happy. The key is to be aware of the great happiness trap, which is believing I'll be happy when. Pause this video for a moment and ask yourself, do I do this? Do I, even without realizing it, think of happiness as a destination that if I can only get this much more or achieve this one more thing, then I'll be happy? It's understandable if you do. We all get caught in this trap from time to time. It's important, though, to understand that this is indeed a trap. That one more thing, that little bit more won't really make you happy. Profoundly happy people will tell you that happiness isn't a destination, something that you find. It's an ongoing, daily pursuit like nutrition or staying physically fit. To help with the mindset of building joy daily, think of happiness as a muscle to build. As I've often written about, you have to feed that happiness muscle regularly or it weakens. The stronger you make the muscle, the more visible it is and the more it supports you, helping you recover more quickly from down times. A strong happiness muscle equals a stronger, happier you. You'll learn how to build this happiness muscle in many ways in this course. For this video, I just wanted to focus you on the game-changing thought that happiness isn't a destination. It's drawn from fully experiencing and taking joy in the world around you every day. Now, I'm not saying that setting, striving for, and achieving long-term goals can't help you achieve happiness too, as you'll see in the next video. I just want to make sure that it registers right up front that you don't have to experience the world through the mindset of, I'll be happy when. is never a bad thing, 
work-life balance, balanced meals, a balanced checkbook, all good. It's no different with happiness, which is fueled by a specific kind of balance. Unlock this equilibrium with the Balance the Scales exercise. Here's how it works. Picture a scale perfectly balanced by two sides of equal weight. Presence in the moment and meaningful goals. Happiness first happens when you're present in the moment, in a mindset to experience simple pleasures and the little joys tucked into daily life. Easier said than done, I know, as Harvard research shows an astonishing 47% of the time, we're not focused on what's right in front of us. And measured happiness in these times is at its lowest. You can get stuck in the unhelpful in-between. When you're not appreciating the experience unfolding before you, nor are you able to fully engage in whatever has you distracted. It can lead to a life half-lived versus fully realized. Instead, before engaging in something, recite the acronym ZINO, Z-I-N-O, which stands for Zone In, Not Out. Remind yourself to be mindful, not mindful. Or keep asking yourself, what has my attention right now? If it's not the thing right in front of you, redirect. Staying present is a profound present for you and those around you. On the other side of the scale, happiness also comes from setting and striving for meaningful goals and ultimately achieving them too, of course. This is especially true when you set and pursue intrinsic goals like personal growth or being better in a relationship. Setting goals like this takes extrinsic or external factors out of play, increasing the likelihood you'll foster more happiness. For example, when you set an extrinsic goal of achieving a certain promoted level at your company, there are so many external factors out of your control that can get in the way. But when you set an intrinsic goal, like becoming better at showing empathy and compassion for others, that's much more in your control and thus likelier to yield happiness. Note that whether it's meaningful, intrinsic, or extrinsic goals you set, you achieve happiness in the pursuit of them, not just the accomplishment. Ask any world-class athlete how they achieve the levels they do, and they'll tell you how important it is to draw joy from the process of achieving excellence, not just in the excellence itself. Also note that using the right language when you're pursuing your goals can lead to even more happiness. Meaning, when you set a goal, don't say, I have to. Say, I get to. For example, when I'm striving to finish writing a book in time for the publication date, I don't say, I have to work overtime this week to stay on track. I say, I get to spend a little more time this week doing and producing something I love. You get the idea. All in all, the Balance the Scales exercise is about ensuring you're giving equal weight to experiencing joy in the now and joy. Think of the last time you were stressed, when you could feel that emotional and physical tension building up, a, a sense of frustration or worry buzzing around, among other unpleasant sensations. That's not exactly a delightful experience. But if you dare, you can diffuse that feeling and invite happiness back in with a detach and recover exercise. The dare. It's a habit-building menu of stress-relieving options you can engage in when needed. Here's how it works. Write down what follows on an index card or anything you can keep handy. When stress strikes, pull out the card and remember, you can detach from what's causing you stress. Mentally switch off the thoughts of that stressor, that's what I mean there, so that you can recover in four ways. First, take Micro breaks. 
short, 10-minute breaks spread throughout the day to help you unplug from the stressor. University of Illinois research shows that micro breaks are surprisingly effective for helping you detach and recover from daily stress. It can be as simple as standing up, stretching, getting a healthy snack, or reading a magazine for a bit. The point is, this method helps shape your mood throughout the day. I use the Pomodoro technique, which is setting a timer to break my workday into intervals, usually 30 minutes in length or so, separated by micro breaks. The next attachment option is to take a break in nature. And it doesn't have to be a super long break. Cornell University research shows that just a 10-minute walk in nature can substantially impact your recovery from stress. If you can immerse yourself in nature for 20 to 30 minutes, even better. As Harvard research shows, this length of time produces the optimal drop in cortisol levels, the hormone that regulates your body's response to stress. Relatedly, the next choice is active detachment. This means engaging in more active pursuits like walking, jogging, or playing a sport. This is as opposed to more inactive things like watching TV or going to the movies, which, while relaxing, and certainly are ways to detach, surprisingly, don't pack as much of a stress-reducing boost as more energetic things. Active detachment also includes shifting your brain from thinking about the stressor to actively engage in something else that requires mental application, like learning a new language or a musical instrument. Finally, you can detach through mindful breathing. Take a few slow, deep breaths through your nose. Imagine you're inhaling peaceful, soothing air that spreads throughout your body with each inhale. When you're exhaling, imagine the stress and tension leaving your body. A few other things to note. With any of these options, be disciplined about truly detaching in those moments to give your mind a break. Psychology research from Germany shows mentally drifting back to that stressor, even just a bit when you're trying to recover, makes it much harder to release that stress valve. And know that you can also create less stress for yourself to begin with by choosing to take on less. I cover how to do that within this course in the video titled, More Happiness from Doing Less. So, when you feel stress creeping in and happiness sneaking out, dare to detach and recover. You know how you feel miserable when you're stuck doing something you don't want to do? Well, I'm sure you've also noticed you're happier when you do more of the things that you do want to do. But you may not know there are three things that, when you expand time spent on them, will disproportionately lead to more happiness. You unlock them by engaging in the expansion exercise. Here's how it works. Create the visual that follows on an index card or anything you can keep handy. Draw three overlapping circles, like this. Label the center, me, and the circles that expand out from the center, mind, connections, and experiences, like so. I'll explain. Science shows expanding your mind by continually learning and growing directly links to more happiness. It creates feelings of competence, a sense of meaning, and moves you closer to living to your fullest potential, which is deeply gratifying. In fact, consider the opposite. Think of a time in your career when you were the most frustrated and unfulfilled. There's a good chance it was when you weren't learning and growing and found yourself asking, am I wasting my time here? Stop this video and list three things you'd like to engage in that will enhance your learning and growth. Then commit to doing them. The next circle is about expanding the time you spend connecting with people that matter to you. 
An 80-year Harvard study revealed the key to happiness is tending to your relationships. Doing so is a far better predictor of happiness than money, fame, social class, IQ, or even genes, the study found. Doing so helps you avoid the 16th second dilemma, which is this. Imagine receiving a phone call where you're informed that you achieved a goal you've been pursuing for a while. For the next 15 seconds, waves of happiness wash over you as you think about how hard you've worked and how good it feels that you achieved that goal. Then, in the 16th second, it hits you. You suddenly realize all the relationships you've sacrificed along the way to achieve that goal. Ouch. Investing in relationships yields happiness. Even better, keep in mind what a 70-year study from Boston University showed, that surrounding yourself with happy people leads to you being happier. And spending time in toxic relationships leads to less happiness. Key here is to remember you largely choose who you surround yourself with. Ask yourself four questions about the people you spend the most time with. Number one. Do they constantly unload their problems on you? Number two, are they pessimistic? Three, do they find ways to be miserable? And four, do they sap your energy? Or are they a lot of work? For those in your life that trigger yeses, shift time spent with them to those who contribute to your happiness. The final circle is about expanding the time you spend on experiences. Research from the University of Colorado shows people are happier when they spend their time and money acquiring life experiences versus material possessions. Turns out it's more rewarding to do than to have. List five experiences you'd enjoy doing, like traveling to a cool location or going to a new art museum and commit to doing those things, if you're able. So, consider where to expand your time spent and make a habit of it. It'll be time well spent. Happiness arises when you do more of what makes you happy, but not when you keep doing more of everything. In other words, happiness also comes when you simplify, delete, do less, when you create less choices for yourself, which helps you avoid what psychologists call the paradox of choice. This says that while you think having many options makes it easier to choose one you'll be happy with, it actually makes it harder to choose and more likely that you'll be unhappy with what you ultimately choose. For help in prioritizing, simplifying, and saying no to more things, all to free up more joy, follow four strategies. Write them down as we go and review them when you need a surge of simplification. First, make a pact for impact. Prioritize making the biggest impact on things that matter most while doing less of the unimportant. To help, keep your or nots in mind. Meaning, before you take on new tasks, ask yourself, will this new work contribute to my priorities or not? If not, don't take that new work on. It also helps to use 2020 vision, meaning work on that 20% most important and urgent of your tasks while keeping sight of the next 20% to work on when you can get to it. The rest, the other 60%, can wait or possibly be eliminated. Thinking about your work in numerical groupings like this prevents you from drifting down into working on things that just aren't as important. For example, maybe you identify the top 20% of your work to be time-sensitive things, like getting that report in on time and items that are critical to your job, like preparing for that big sales call. Then, you identify the next 20% as things that are important that you need to get to as soon as is feasible 
but that aren't urgent, like conducting that competitive analysis. The rest you schedule to work on later or delegate or eliminate. By the way, I'm not saying don't do maintenance work, things that aren't as critical but still have to be done. It's about keeping your portfolio of work dominated by high-impact, important tasks or projects, which will lead to a greater sense of satisfaction. Next, think weights and measures. Meaning, be honest about the weight of any work before you take it on. Stop and ask yourself, how much work will this really take? And thoughtfully measure the amount of time you think it'll take too, remembering that things always take longer than expected, a rule known as Hofstetter's Law. If the new work still makes the cut, so be it. It's about careful consideration versus careless overcommitment. Next up, have a to-don't list. This is a twist on the classic to-do list. Write down things you want to avoid getting pulled into, like saying yes to that coworker who always asks for favors. The list then serves as a reminder to, well, don't. Research is clear on the power of writing down your goals versus just keeping them in your head. This power also applies to writing down goals of what not to do. Finally, addition by subtraction. When you choose to do less, you accomplish more, which adds more joy. Wishful thinking tricks you into believing that if you're always taking on more and doing more, more will get done and you'll be happier. But more often, it just leads to exhaustion and burnout. So, less can be more. More happiness. Especially when you follow these four strategies. It can be challenging enough at times to foster happiness in your life. Why would you spend time doing things that drain it? Of course, you don't do so intentionally. In fact, there are four common things you can engage in that sneak up on you and take over your happiness, creating feelings that are anything but. Avoid these happiness hijackers. Write them down as we go on an index card or anything you can keep handy. Keep an eye on them and don't let them take over. First, Negativity bias. Negativity bias is a tendency to feel and react to negative events more intensely than positive events. To overcome it and its happiness draining impact, use the ABC model, a framework popular in positive psychology. The A stands for adversity, B for beliefs, and C for consequences. The model teaches that adversity creates beliefs, not consequences. Said another way, adversity doesn't automatically mean negative outcomes. The negativity bias might fuel you to believe it will, but in truth, the outcome of adversity is determined by how you react to it. So, resist the negativity bias and choose optimism and positive energy instead. Next, overthinking. When you spend too much time thinking and worrying and too little time accepting and moving forward, happiness quickly exits. Spot when you're doing this and remember that overthinking and problem solving aren't the same thing. Constantly revisiting scenarios, well, it feels like you're problem solving, doing something useful, but you're just spinning in a circle. Recognize when you're overthinking, realize it's not problem solving, and move forward. Next up, perfectionism. Perfectionism prevents you from achieving success rather than helping you achieve it. Since perfection is rarely ever realized, it's quite likely to cause frustration and disappointment, the opposite of happiness. Instead, get good at good enough. Here's what I mean. Chances are nobody's holding you to the same standards you're holding yourself to. 
There's nothing wrong with high standards. Of course, that's healthy. The problem arises when you view success as all or nothing all the time. So get good at good enough. By the way, you can get more help on overcoming perfectionism and overthinking in my LinkedIn Learning course, Eight Ways You Block Your Success. Finally, too much news in social media. Research shows that reported news has been more negative with each passing decade. No surprise as it's an established fact that negative headlines draw far more clicks than positive ones and everybody wants eyeballs on their channel. Unfortunately, negative news stresses us out far more than positive stories give us enjoyment. So the bombardment of negative news causes anxiety, distorts your view of the world, and creates excessive worry. Not exactly happiness-inducing conditions. The key is to keep the bigger picture in perspective and to not allow negative news to become bigger than it really is, causing you to lose sight of all that's good in your life. Keep in mind all the good news you receive every day, even if in small ways, like when you get a compliment or you have a great day at a job you really like. So, make a habit of avoiding these happiness hijackers and you'll invite more highlights versus lowlights into your life. <laughs>